so today there was a, a fascinating article published in Pirate Wires. Uh, I like Pirate Wires quite a bit. It is a uh, it is a um, Substack, an alternative. Uh, they feature they they are positioning themselves as a as another alternative media source. They have reporters. They have opinion writers. Um, they are positioning themselves as a media source coming out of Silicon Valley. So uh, Pirate Wires is written by somebody who is a, I think a partner, uh, but, but a, a senior guy at Partners, Partners Fund? Founders Fund, sorry, Founders Fund, which is Peter Thiel's, uh, Peter Thiel's venture capital arm. Um, and, uh, but they are building out, if you will, a, a, a media, a, a media source. And, um, uh, and uh, they are, uh, they're quite good. I, I don't. I don't agree with all the opinions. I don't agree with all the the way in which they spin certain articles. But overall, another valuable alternative media source, together with Barry Weiss's, together with the Dispatch, uh, together with a bunch of others that I uh, that I follow out there. Uh, Pirate Wire is uh, is the most interesting one when it comes to tech uh, and, and uh, crypto banking uh, banking and. Um, in AI and, and other tech issues, I highly recommend it. So if you're interested, uh, piratewires.com, you can find it. Pi piratewires.com, you can find it there. Uh, as to the name, it has a certain anarchist implication. I, 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 you know, I don't think that's what they're going for. Okay, so I just posted a link to their latest article. The latest article, is this is the title, and this is why I, I wanted to talk about it and post the title of the article is, Did the Government Start a, financial, a Global Financial Crisis in an Attempt to Destroy Crypto? And uh, the author, Nick Carter, um, is, is trying to make the ca case that it is regulators and politicians like Elizabeth Warren who basically created this banking crisis um, as an as a unintended consequence of their attempts to shut down the crypto space and to shut down uh, the relationship between banks and, um, and crypto. I, in a previous episode, I can't remember when, a, a month ago, a few weeks ago, I can't even remember time anymore. Uh, I, I, I told you about Operation Choke Point 2.0, which is basically what uh, this is being called. And, uh, and, and, and that was also an, uh, from an article from Nick Carter uh, from back where, and then six weeks ago, he posted that six weeks ago, and I talked about it about then. Um, that uh, six weeks ago, we, I reported on, on a bunch of different things that the feds were doing in order to try to, to, to separate banking from crypto. First of all, they were not approving any kind of new crypto banks. There was actually a new bank that had asked for a charter and tried to get a charter, which uh, part of its business plan was to have a 100% reserve requirement. So 100% reserve, so they could beat all bank runs, no problem. And yet their charter was uh, denied. Uh, a number of banks, a number of institutions that had done uh, financial, uh, any kind of financial transactions for crypto uh, were being pressured, shut down, and, and heavily influenced. As part of that, uh, you, probably, uh, you probably know, we talked about it at the time, but, but it, it became even more acute, there was heavy pressure on, on Silvergate, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of talk, and, and uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, office was involved in attempts to try, Silvergate uh, is a bank that uh, uh, banked crypto and, and was known as the crypto bank. It was a small community bank from Southern California that started to get into crypto in 2014 and had a lot of crypto deposits. Now again, when you have deposits, that doesn't mean you're not invested in crypto, you're not buying crypto, you're not holding crypto. Those would be pretty unstable assets for a bank to hold. They were just banking. It was just a banking relationship. If you started a crypto company, you typically opened a bank account with Silvergate. They were open to that. They also provided a platform for the for, for exchange of crypto into, into US dollars. So they provided services to crypto companies and they provided an easy way to get in and out. Anyway, uh, starting in January, uh, you know, there was heavy pressure on, on, uh, on Silvergate to shut down its crypto relationships, of course, shutting down the crypto relationships. Um, or, or there was heavy pressure that 
it, this, th these relationships were going to be investigated, that these relationships were somehow not kosher, that these relationships were somehow bad. Now, remember, crypto in the United States today is a legal business. Technically, th there's, there's nothing wrong with me having a relationship with a crypto company. And as a bank, there's no reason in the world it's a legal business for me to have a banking relationship with a legal business in the United States. It's not illegal. It's not even questionable like, let's say, marijuana dis a dispensary or marijuana growers where it's legal on a state level and not legal at the federal level. No, no. Crypto is legal at every level. And yet, dispersion was, play you know, uh, 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 the political class put pressure and the regulatory class put pressure on uh, Silvergate, uh, put pressure on the crypto community. And what happened was uh, crypto was starting, you know, was leaving, was leaving Silvergate. Not that they have an alternative, but leaving Silvergate. Ultimately leading, and I spoke about this on a previous episode, ultimately leading to Silvergate voluntarily closing in, uh, in the first week of March, which is the first bank in the series now of banks that have been shuttered. But this is all an issue of, I mean, Silvergate was not bankrupt. Silvergate was not insolvent. Silvergate was pressured basically ultimately to shut down because it dealt with clients, the government, our government, American government, outside of the rule of law, ignoring the rule of law, dismissing the rule of law, decided were unacceptable. And therefore, forced the financial institution to liquidate. Now, there were all kinds of issues with Silvergate relating to FTX and so on. But nobody accused Silvergate of fraud. Uh, Silvergate took a hit because of FTX. FTX is the, is the fraudulent crypto exchange. But Silvergate was not, its business model was not threatened or, or it, put it this way, the business model survived the FTX threat. And yet, it was still forced, ultimately, to shut down. Now, what is interesting is in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank being shuttered Friday morning, which again, almost never happens. It's usually they wait until Friday afternoon to shutter it, thus doing it in the morning, creating panic in the market. You know, we've already talked about uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But then regulators waited until Sunday, which is truly unprecedented, to then decide to shut down Signature. Now, what stands out with Signature Bank? Well, two things. One is that it had uninsured deposits similar to what um, Silicon Valley Bank, less but similar to what Silicon Valley ha Bank had. But from all accounts, Signature had uh, withstood the run on the bank, was in okay liquidity position, um, given that the Federal Reserve ultimately guaranteed all its deposits. It, it, it looked like it could open Monday morning and would probably survive. What is the other thing that stands out about Signature? Well, the other thing that stands out about Signature is that 20% of its deposits were crypto deposits. And there is a real case to be made, and Nick Carter makes this article, and uh, Bonnie Frank, a politician I despise, but who was on the board of Signature Bank, makes in interviews that he's had uh, uh, since the closure of Signature Bank, he's made the same case. The case is that Signature Bank was not closed because it was uh, bankrupt. It was not closed because of the run on the bank, although all these things, uh, uh, the run on the bank gave them the excuse. It was closed, indeed, to send a clear additional signal to the world out there that crypto and banking did not belong together, that the feds, the regulators would not tolerate crypto, even as a deposit base, would not tolerate crypto um, as, as, as part of their deposit base. $4.3 billion of shareholder value was evaporated just puff went into smoke as a result of this. Shareholders will get zero. The bank was later sold to uh, New York Community Bank, 
without the crypto deposits, again, emphasizing that you cannot have crypto deposits. Why? These are cash deposits. This is money. Legal business, legal enterprise. One wonders what New York regulators and the, and the feds were thinking when they shuttered, uh, when they shuttered Signature. And, I mean, the bank was not insolvent. Um, and it clearly looks like the government overreacted, but probably overreacted on purpose, to, in spite of the fact that they're denying it, to send a signal. Now, here's, here's the, the, the bottom line of this, because I want you to get the, the, the magnitude of this. And, and, and this happens, it, it happens not just in banking, it happens in other industries, certainly happened in the auto industry, the auto industry by the Obama administration in 2009. This is a complete negation of the rule of law. This is saying that politicians and regulators at their own discretion, at their own whim, can decide that a particular industry is unacceptable to them without going through a legislative process of banning this industry or increasing regulations on the industry or doing anything at their own whim, whim. They can destroy, they can uh, eliminate this industry. In this case, they've attempted crypto. I mean, the whole crypto thing is interesting because Bitcoin and a lot of other crypto stocks are way up in spite of the fact that they're clearly under assault here. I wonder if the crypto investors are fully cognizant of what is going on and the implications of it. But this is a funnel assault on what they're doing, and it's a funnel assault that nobody seems to care about. Other than private wires, where else are you hearing about this? But this is a complete negation of the rule of law, one, by going after crypto, legal industry, and not through increased regulation of crypto, uh, you know, reevaluating, uh, I don't know, crypto as a security, although they're doing that, again, unilaterally without Congress. Uh, uh, crypto after crypto is being defined as a security and therefore falling under the SEC regulations uh, versus being an asset or versus being something else. So massive, and you know me, I'm, I'm not exactly a crypto gung-ho about Bitcoin and crypto, but, but, you know, again, legal industry, people are putting billions of dollars into it. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of stuff going on. Who knows what will come of it? And politicians and regulators unilaterally crushing this. So that's one aspect of rule of law, which is just horrific. A second aspect of the rule of law here is they can go into a bank that is solvent, but they don't like something about it. In this case, they have crypto deposits, or they didn't like the managers, or, and they can just shut it down with almost no repercussions. Now, I, I assume there's going to be a lawsuit. Uh, 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 Bonnie Frank implied that there would be a lawsuit, but if you read Bonnie Frank, who was on the board. I mean, he's very clear that the bank was doing the right things, that the bank is not, was not a crypto bank. The bank, indeed, most of its bank's clients were real estate companies. The, the, the bank was primarily banking uh, multifamily um, real estate in, in New York. And the reason it had uh, an interest deposit was because these were big real estate companies holding massive deposits at the bank and holding them liquid so they could make investments and they could in and out and 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 they held more than 250,000 because they were big and you know in normal times these are stable businesses these are big businesses these, these not it's not even uh, you know these are businesses that are unlikely to panic unlikely to run on the bank and there was someone on the bank on Friday before they were closed but that had slowed down, and there was no indication that Monday was going to be a disaster for them. And, the, and, and I've said this before, but the fact that Signature was closed on a Sunday created unbelievable panic, and I think created the bloodbath that was Monday, Black Monday, as I think in the banking sector at least it'll come to be known. 
So we have a situation where we've given unelected bureaucrats the power to, based on really, ultimately, based on their whim, based on their preferences, shut down financial institutions, and we've given politicians and regulators the power to shut down or attempt to shut down whole industries. And, and this is devastating for, for this country. It's, it's, it's devastating, right? It's devastating for what we are, uh, you know, any kind of freedom and any kind of uh, hope for true liberty in this country. I mean, this is, uh, this is a slap in the face and, uh, and it only get worse because if you don't deal with it, this, this negation of the rule of law, they'll only double up on it. They'll only take on more and more power for themselves. So I think very, very, very bad what's going on in, um, in the banking space and in the crypto space for everybody, even those of you who might not be. As you know, I, I do invest in this space and I have not done well. Um, in the last uh, 10 years, it's been pretty nasty. But uh, beyond that, anybody should be concerned about what's going on in this space given the way the government is behaving uh, because this is just an indication of the kind of power it, it, just a senator like Elizabeth Warren has by, by sending out letters, by threatening, by talking about this stuff. She has the power to drive markets. And that is super dangerous, particularly given, given her views and given her perspectives and given her viciousness and a willingness to go after people she dislikes, even at the expense of, quote, quote the economy. All right, uh, I highly recommend reading, if you want to be, if you want to get the, the, the juicy details, reading, did the government start a global financial crisis in an attempt to destroy crypto? I don't think it's a full story. I think we will get the full story in the months and maybe years to come. I think we'll get a much better story on Signature if there's a lawsuit, and as that lawsuit goes through the process, Bonnie Frank suggested there might be a lawsuit, and he as a director had to be careful on what he was going to say because of the potential lawsuit. Uh, said it might take years before we really know what happened. But whatever happened, it doesn't look good, and it doesn't look good for the rule of law in America. That's what I can say. Okay, so I, I've already posted the link to the Pirate Wire article. I will post it again in the chat. And uh, feel free, and, and again, it's a substack that's probably worth subscribing to. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brook Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.